you know, it comes to 22.57 at Savati. Monks, a monk who is killed in seven cases and a triple investigator is called in this Dhamma Vinaya a consummate one, one who has fully lived the holy life, the highest kind of person. And how monks is a monk skilled in seven cases? Here monks, a monk understands body, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation. He understands the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of body. He understands feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, their origin, cessation, and the way leading to cessation. He understands the gratification, danger, and escape in the case of the aggregates. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, when the Buddha talks about seven cases, huh, it means huh, first the element, huh, the aggregate. Huh? Huh? That means either body or feeling or perception, volition or consciousness. Huh? So the aggregate, then how it originates, how it ceases, and the way leading to its cessation. So there are four, four cases already. And then the gratification, danger and escape. Huh? another three cases. So the four plus three becomes seven. And what mounts is body. Four great elements and the form derived from the four great elements that is called form or body. With the arising of nutriment, there is the arising of body. With the cessation of nutriment, there is the cessation of body. This noble hateful path is the way leading to the cessation of body. That is, right view, right thoughts, etc., up down to right concentration. Stop here for a moment. So here, when you say body, uh, you refer to the four great elements la, and the form derived from the four great elements. La. And then body arises from nutriment. La. When there is a nutriment for the body, uh, the, the, the body will arise. La. And then when there is no nutriment, la, then the body will cease. La. And but that is uh, temporary seizing. La. Permanent seizing la, is the Noble Eightfold Path la, leading to the permanent seizing of body. La. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on body, that is the gratification in body. That body is impermanent, suffering and subject to change is the danger in body. Re the removal and abandonment of desire and lust for body, this is the escape from body. Let's stop here for a moment. La. Here as I as we discussed uh, uh, one or two nights ago, uh, gratification in body uh, is the joy, the pleasure uh, you get uh, from seeing the body, uh, for example, seeing a 16-year-old girl uh, at the height of her beauty. Uh, and then the danger uh, in body uh, is that it is impermanent uh, and it is suffering. Uh. How? Uh, as I quoted uh, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha said, uh, imagine the beautiful 16-year-old girl. Uh, after some time, uh, when she becomes sick, uh, then uh, she's, she lies on the bed, uh, uh, cannot move, uh, cannot get up from the bed. Uh, and uh, passing urine and uh, shit uh, on the bed, uh, and she cannot help herself. Uh, got to be lifted up by some, uh, got to be fed by others, uh, got to be bathed by others. And then... Uh, looking so weak and all that. Nah? Uh, and then uh, and then all the loveliness has disappeared. Nah? Uh, all the Buddha says, uh, now imagine uh, when she's 80 or 90 or 100 years old, uh, all the hair has turned white or bald, uh, and uh, the teeth has gone, and the skin is all wrinkled and blotchy, and she might be hunched back and walking us uh, with a stick, nah? shivering, nah? so weak. Nah? Uh, so that also, uh, you see the danger the Buddha says. Uh, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, she will die and turn into a corpse. Uh, and the corpse will be smelly and, and bloated and blue-black and oozing uh, liquid uh, from the nine openings. Uh, uh, so that is the danger uh, in the body. And then the escape uh, is to remove desire and lust for the body. Uh, uh, that is the escape of having a body again. Buddha continued, whatever ascetics and Brahmins, having thus directly known body, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, having thus directly known the gratification, danger, the escape in the case of body, are practicing for the purpose of revulsion towards body, for its fading away and cessation. They are practicing well. Those who are practicing well 
have gained a foothold in this Dhamma Vinaya. Stop here for a moment. So, if we understand the Dhamma, so even though uh, we have not let go of attachment to the body and the mind, uh, but we slowly uh, try to see uh, more clearly uh, how uh, the body and the mind is a source of uh, suffering. So, we are practicing uh, towards letting go. Uh, so, if we are practicing towards letting go uh, of the body and mind and the world, uh, uh, then uh, we are practicing well, uh, we have understood the Dhamma Vinaya. And whatever ascetics and Brahmins, having thus directly known body, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, having thus directly known the gratification, danger, and escape in the case of body, true revulsion towards body, through its fading away and cessation, are liberated by non clinging. They are well liberated. Those who are well liberated are consummate ones. As to those consummate ones, there is no round for describing them. Uh, so, if a person has totally uh, let go uh, of his body, uh, then he becomes liberated. Uh, then he does not go on the round of rebirths anymore. Uh. And what monks is feeling? There are these six classes of feeling. Feeling born of eye contact, feeling born of ear contact, uh, feeling born of nose contact, feeling born of tongue contact, feeling born of body contact, feeling born of mind contact. This is called feeling. With the arising of contact, there is the arising of feeling. The cessation of contact, there is the cessation of feeling. This noble eightfold path is the way leading to the cessation of feeling. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So feeling huh, arises huh, because of contact huh, at the six sense doors. Huh. Uh, our eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind uh, are the six sense organs. Uh, and when the object uh, of these six sense bases uh, come come close by, uh, and then uh, uh, we sense them, uh, there is contact. Uh. So with the contact, uh, feeling arises. Uh. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on feeling, this is the gratification in feeling. That feeling is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. This is the danger in feeling. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for feeling. This is the escape from feeling. Whatever ascetics and Brahmins, having thus directly known feeling, its origin, cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, having thus directly known the gratification, danger, and escape, in the case of feeling, are practicing for the purpose of revulsion towards feeling, for its fading away and cessation, they are practicing well. Those who are practicing well have gained a foothold in this Dhamma Vinaya. Uh, so similarly, uh, the Buddha says, uh, if a person uh, uh, understands uh, these things, uh, the, the aggregate, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to a cessation, uh, and understands the gratification, danger, and escape, uh, uh, then uh, we are practicing for the purpose of revulsion, letting go, uh, uh, whatever ascetics and Brahmins, having thus directly known feeling, etc., those are consummate ones. Uh, uh, so those who have fully, totally let go of uh, feeling, uh, uh, then they become liberated. And what monks is perception? There are these six classes of perception. Perception of forms, perception of sounds, perception of smells, perception of taste, perception of touch, perception of thoughts. Uh, mm. This is called perception. With the arising of contact, there is the arising of perception. With the cessation of contact, there is the cessation of perception. This noble eightfold path is the way leading to the cessation of perception. Let's stop here for a moment. So just now we said now uh, with contact now uh, feeling arises. After feeling now uh, you have perception. Uh, that means you perceive, like for example, you see something, you perceive that it's yellow or blue or white, whatever. Uh, the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on perception, that is the gratification in perception. That perception is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. This is the danger in perception. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for perception, that is the escape from perception. Similarly, whatever ascetic and Brahmins are, understand this uh, and they let go, uh, they are consummate ones. Uh. And what monks are volitions? There are six classes of volition. Volition regarding forms, sounds, smells, 
taste, touch, and thoughts. This is called volition. With the arising of contact, there is a rising of volition. With the seizing of contact, there is a seizing of volition. The Noble Eightfold Path is the way leading to the cessation of volition. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on volition, this is the gratification in volition. That volition is impermanent, suffering and subject to change is the danger in volition. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for volition, that is the escape from volition. And what is consciousness? There are these six classes of consciousness. I, consciousness, ear, consciousness, nose, consciousness, tongue, consciousness, body, consciousness, mind, consciousness. This is called consciousness. The arising of mentality and materiality, nama rupa, there is the arising of consciousness. With the cessation of nama rupa, there is the cessation of consciousness. This noble eightfold path is the way leading to the cessation of consciousness. Stop here for a moment. Consciousness uh, is said uh, to arise because of Nama Rupa. Because as I mentioned before, uh, consciousness and Nama Rupa. Consciousness, the Pali is Vinyana. Nama Rupa, uh, the translation is mentality, materiality. Uh, and you can consider that to be phenomenal. Uh, what consciousness is conscious of. Uh, when consciousness arises, uh, it must be conscious of something, that something is Nama Rupa. So in English we call that phenomena. So, and these two, consciousness and mentality, materiality, they always rise together and cease together. They cannot exist one by itself. They must always exist together and cease together. They are a pair, Siamese twins joined to each other. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on consciousness, that is the gratification in consciousness. That consciousness is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. This is the danger in consciousness. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for consciousness, that is the escape. Whatever in ascetics and brahmins, having thus directly known consciousness, its origin, cessation, we are leading to its cessation. Having thus directly known the gratification, danger and escape, the case of consciousness, are practicing for the purpose of revulsion towards consciousness, or its fading away and cessation. They are practicing well. Those who are practicing well have gained a foothold in this Dhamma Vinaya. Whatever ascetics and Brahmins, having thus directly known consciousness, its origin, cessation and the way leading to its cessation, having thus directly known gratification, danger and escape in the case of consciousness, through revulsion towards consciousness, through its fading away and cessation, are liberated by non-clinging. They are well liberated. Those who are well liberated are consummate ones. As to those consummate ones, there is no round for describing them. This in such a way that a monk is killed in seven cases. And how monks is a monk a triple investigator? Here monks, a monk investigates by way of the elements, by way of the sense basis, and by way of dependent origination. It is in such a way that a monk is a triple investigator. Monks, a monk who is killed in these seven cases and a triple investigator is called in this Dhamma Vinaya a consummate one, one who has fully lived the holy life, the highest kind of person. So here finally uh, the Buddha says uh, uh, we should investigate uh, by three ways. La. One is by way of the elements. The elements uh, are the Dattus. La. Uh, we went through the Sangyutta called the Dattu Sangyutta, I think it was chapter 14. Uh, and then the sense basis, uh, we haven't come, uh, that is uh, chapter 35, uh, Salayatana Sangyutta. Uh, and then the third one is dependent origination. Uh, that one we went through already, chapter 12, uh, Nidana Sangyutta. Uh, so, although it does not mention, uh, since he has already gone through uh, just now, yeah, and another way of uh, investigating uh, is the five aggregates. Uh. In fact, the five aggregates are the most important. Uh, and uh, if we investigate the five aggregates, uh, then uh, we can become an Arya. Uh. So that's the end of the Sutta. Uh. So here the Buddha is saying uh, the five aggregates, uh, we have to understand the aggregate itself, how it arises, how it ceases, and the way leading to its cessation. And also you have to understand the gratification, the satisfaction uh, that comes from that aggregate, the danger in that aggregate, 
they escape from the aggregate. Uh, so these are the seven cases. The next sutra is 22.58 as Savati. Uh, the Buddha said, Monks, the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha, liberated by non clinging through revulsion towards body, through its fading away and cessation, is called a perfectly enlightened one. A monk liberated by wisdom, liberated by non clinging through revulsion towards body, through its fading away and cessation, is called one liberated by wisdom. The Tathagata Arahan, perfectly enlightened one, a Samasambuddha, liberated by non clinging through revulsion towards feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, through the fading away and cessation, is called a Samasambuddha. A monk liberated by wisdom, liberated by non-clinging to revulsion towards feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, to the fading away and cessation, is called one liberated by wisdom. Therein, monks, what is the distinction? What is the disparity? What is the difference between the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha, and a monk liberated by wisdom? Let's stop here for a moment. Uh, this is also one important sutta. So the Buddha is saying, uh, that a Buddha is liberated uh, because of revulsion, uh, revulsion of the five aggregates, uh, uh, and and he does not cling to the five aggregates. Uh, and the disciple, uh, the Arahan disciple, uh, it becomes liberated uh, in the same way uh, by understanding the aggregates, uh, and then uh, becoming disenchanted with the aggregates. Uh, seeing revulsion uh, and then stop clinging to them uh, and then he also becomes liberated. Uh. So here the Buddha is saying what is the difference uh, between a Buddha and his disciple uh, liberated. Uh. You see, uh, the, the, during the Buddha's time, uh, the Buddha is called the Arahan, Tathagata, Samasambuddha. The monk disciples are not called Arahans. You know. The monk disciples are called monk liberated by wisdom. Or a monk liberated by mind, or a monk liberated both ways. Both ways means liberated by wisdom as well as liberated by mind. So the Buddha only is called the Arahan, and then later people don't understand, and they differentiate between the Buddha and the Arahan and say the Arahan has not finished his work, whereas the Buddha has finished his work. But we find in the suttas uh, the Buddha says. Uh, uh, after you see uh, the rest of the sutta, there's practically no difference between the Buddha and the Arahan disciple. And then the disciple said, Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. Take recourse in the Blessed One. It would be good if the Blessed One would clear up the meaning of this statement. Having heard it from him, the monks will remember it. So here the Buddha is asking them, like, what's the difference between the teacher, the Buddha, and his disciples are uh, liberated by wisdom. And they could not uh, explain, so they asked the Buddha to kindly explain. Then listen and attend closely, monks, I will speak. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said, The Tathagata monks, Arahan Samasambuddha, is the originator of the path unarisen before, the producer of the path unproduced before, the declarer of the path undeclared before. He is the knower of the path, the discoverer of the path, the one skilled in the path. And his disciples now dwell following that path and become possessed of it afterwards. This monks is the distinction, this, the disparity, the difference between the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha and a monk liberated by wisdom. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that the Buddha is the one who first discovered the path. The path here means uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. So the Noble Eightfold Path uh, is a path uh, that is practiced uh, by all Buddhas and all Arahants. Anyone uh, who be wants to become liberated uh, must practice this Noble Eightfold Path. This is the one and only way uh, for liberation. Uh, nowadays, uh, people confuse learners uh, by saying uh, there are 84,000 Dharma doors. The Buddha never mentioned even once uh, that there are 84,000 Dharma doors. The Buddha always says there's only one path to Nibbana, one path to liberation, 
only one and no other path, and that is the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that he is the one uh, who has rediscovered the Noble Eightfold Path. He is the first uh, to bring it back to this world. Uh, okay? And he is very familiar with the path. Uh. He teaches the path. Uh. And he teaches his disciples the same path. Uh. And his disciples also follow him, uh, practicing the same path. In other words, uh, the path that the Buddha walks and his Arahant disciple walks uh, is no different at all. Since that the Buddha is the first Arahant uh, and the others are later Arahants. Uh, uh. So the Buddha said uh, that is the only distinction, uh, the difference uh, between uh, Arahant, uh, uh, the Buddha, and his disciples uh, liberated by wisdom. Uh. So you see here, in the Buddha's own words, uh, he says, uh, actually, there's no difference between him and his disciples. Only he's the first Arahant, and they are later Arahants. Well, nowadays, people don't understand. Uh, they make such a big distinction uh, between the Buddha and the uh, Arahant disciples. And they come up with a lot of things uh, that the Buddha never said before. Uh, all that rubbish uh, which the Buddha said. Uh, it's not found in the original suttas. Uh, uh, those uh, are the words of disciples, things like paramis, uh, that the Buddha cultivated paramis uh, for such a long time, four asankhya kapas and 100 maha kapas. Now, when you look into the suttas, uh, there's not a single sutta uh, where the Buddha spoke about parami. The Buddha also never heard the word parami. Uh, we are so smart, we are smarter than the Buddha. We talk about parami. The Buddha doesn't understand what is parami. Uh, so this uh, is very misleading uh, when you talk about parami and that you have to cultivate paramis over such a long time. Uh, uh, and then when you look closely, uh, where, do, where do you find these uh, uh, teachings about the parami? They come from the Jataka stories. And the Jataka, the Jataka stories uh, are so childish uh, and yet so many people believe in them. Uh, the deer can speak uh, the rabbit can talk uh, like a human being. Uh, uh, the rabbit can behave uh, smarter than a human being. Uh, uh, the story, the, the Jataka about the rabbit, uh, he saw the hunter uh, hunting the whole day in the forest. Uh, he could not uh, kill any animal. Uh, so he was boiling the water, uh, very hungry and uh, nothing to eat. And according to the Jataka story, uh, our Bodhisatta in the previous life was this rabbit. Uh, he saw this poor hunter, nothing to eat. He jumped into the boiling water, uh, committed suicide uh, for the hunter to eat. Such childish stories, uh, a lot of people believe. Uh, uh, and even uh, the stories about uh, the Buddha, Vesantara, Jataka, uh, because he wanted to perfect his parami of giving, uh, he gave away his wife and, and two children uh, to a heartless beggar. Uh, he knows the beggar will beat them, uh, will make them suffer and all that, nah, still he gave them away, yeah. uh, uh, which contradicts the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha says, uh, a wise man's uh, charity yeah, must not harm himself, must not harm others. So in the case of this Vesantara Jataka, he harms his wife, he harms his two children, and he harms himself. All for what? <laughs> so it's very silly, yeah? a lot of uh, silly teachings now taught. In fact, talking about the Cultivating the, cultivating the paramis over four asankhya kapas and 100 maha kapas. Uh, we find in the suttas uh, that the Buddha only took three lifetimes to get out of samsara. Not even one uh, world cycle, you know, three lifetimes. Uh, the Buddha said in a the, in the previous life, uh, in this kapa, in this world, in this present earth, uh, he met the Buddha Kasapa. And when he met the Buddha Kasapa, he was a Brahmin, so he had no interest to see the Buddha Kasapa. His friend, his good friend, the pot maker, Gatikara, asked him to go many times, he refused, until the, the Gatikara pulled him by the hair, then only he had to go. Then when he went to see the Buddha Kasapa, he refused to pay respect to the Buddha Kasapa. But the Buddha Kasapa, out of, because uh, Gatikara pleaded with the Buddha to teach his friend the Bodhisatta some Dhamma. Then the Buddha Kasapa taught him some Dhamma. After hearing that Dhamma, he must have attained stream entry eh, because he changed completely eh, and became a monk. Uh, after becoming a monk, eh, he must have attained at least the first jhana because uh, 
according to the suttas, after that birth, na, he went up to the Tusita heaven for a long time. Na. But he came back na, to this same earth, na. that means within this same world cycle. Na. He was born as Siddhartha Gautama. After uh, being born as Siddhartha Gautama, as a small boy, na, about 10 years old, na, he could attain the first jhana under the jambu tree. Na. So that shows uh, he had probably attained the first jhana. And if he had already attained the first jhana under the Buddha Kasapa, I'm quite sure uh, he would be, have become a Sakadagamin. Uh, Sakadagamin. Uh. So he is a Sakadagamin. Uh, his time uh, to enter Nibbana is right. Uh. The Sakadagamin is called a once-returner. He comes back to the human rebirth uh, only one more time. Uh, he must enter Nibbana. Uh, from there we can understand uh, why Siddhartha Gautama with such a rich, wealthy, happy family, uh, he gave up everything uh, and went into the jungle uh, and lived an ascetic life uh, until he became enlightened. Uh, that can only happen uh, because he's a Saka the Garmin. An ordinary person cannot do that. Uh, people say you've gone out of your mind. Uh, such a happy family, you live, live uh, and you go off and become a beg- beggar. Uh, so, so you see, uh, a lot of things in the suttas, if you study carefully, uh, is completely different from later books like the Jatakas and the Abhidhamma and the commentaries and all that. Okay, I think I'll stop here. I think they discuss. I find it a bit strange, you know. Some people, they listen to my talks uh, and then they are shocked. Uh. You see, uh, all the Sunday schools uh, are teaching the children about the Jataka stories and the Paramis and all that. Nobody uh, uh, pointed out uh, that all these are not the Buddha's teachings. Mm. You see, the, we read the suttas about Mara, Mara Sangyuta. Mara is very powerful. See, you cannot escape from me. You cannot escape from samsara. <laughs> yeah. What page? Yeah. When you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, eh, you are practicing Sila, Samadhi and Panya. So eh, when you have Samadhi, eh, you will see things as they clearly, uh, as they truly are. Lah. So you will be, understand the five aggregates eh, as they truly are. Lah. So when you understand the five aggregates as they truly are, then you will let go, lah, let go of the five aggregates. Lah. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessary. Uh, this, uh, but then generally, if you study the Dhamma, then you study all. Uh, you will study the uh, elements. You will study the uh, six senses. You will study dependent origination. You will study the uh, five aggregates. Everything. Uh, but if you specialize in one, uh, for example, five aggregates, uh, you understand it, and, and that is it's enough. Uh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you, you can use your own clean combination. But one thing you have to bear in mind uh, that they are quite related. Uh, quite related. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, 
Uh, even though during the Buddha's time, uh, uh, disciples of the Buddha disrobed, uh, but I'm quite sure uh, the percent uh, is much less than now. Uh. Now, because the teacher is not uh, Sama Sambuddha uh, who can read your mind, uh, so more people disrobe. Uh, and uh, during the Buddha's time, uh, those who disrobe, uh, uh, I think they don't have wisdom. Uh, because uh, if you look into the cases, uh, there was one, uh, after he disrobed, uh, he was talking bad about the Buddha. And uh, he said, uh, according to the Sutta, it seems out, one of the reasons uh, why he disrobed uh, was that he kept asking the Buddha to show him psychic power. And the Buddha refused to show him psychic power. So he assumed that the Buddha had no psychic power. And then he said, uh, those external ascetics uh, are so ascetic, uh, they practice all kinds of... Uh, what we call Ku Sing, uh, uh, ascetic practices, uh, austerities, uh, whereas the Buddha never practiced. What he didn't realize was the Buddha had gone through all the austerities uh, more than uh, the ascetics, uh, other ascetics. But because the Buddha found that they were quite useless, uh, then the Buddha only uh, adopted uh, those uh, that were beneficial, uh, like eating one meal a day, going on arms round, wearing only one set of robes. Uh, so that the Buddha calls a middle path, la, but to some people it's already very ascetic. La. So if a, if a person uh, has got a Samasu, some Buddha as your teacher uh, and you still fail to make the grade, uh, then there must be something wrong with you, la, not the teacher. Sometimes uh, you find... Uh, in the case that the case I just mentioned just now, uh, that guy had no wisdom at all. On the other hand, there are some like uh, Devadatta. Uh, it was because of the ego uh, and the greed for fame, uh, for offerings. Uh, so it's mentioned in the Sutta uh, because he showed his psychic power to the prince. Uh, the prince was so impressed. Uh, every day uh, uh, offered him the two meals, like breakfast and dinner. Uh, and each meal, uh, 500 dishes uh, were offered to him. And if he had any decency in him, uh, I mean, if he, he was really a monk, uh, he would not want to accept 500 dishes every meal. For him to accept 500 dishes every meal, uh, shows uh, that the ego is so big, he thinks he deserves it. <laughs> uh, so such a person... Uh, uh, even before he left the Buddha, the Buddha already foresaw. Uh, that's why in the, that's one sutta about the Buddha saying the different disciples, uh, of the various uh, monks, uh, they are the same type, uh, like those that follow Venerable Sariputta, all of great wisdom. Those that follow Mahamogalana, all have great psychic power. Those that follow Mahakasapa, all very ascetic. But uh, the Buddha said, oh, those that follow Devadatta, uh, all very greedy. Uh, like evil desires. So that's why uh, our motive uh, in wearing the robe is very important. Different people uh, come to wear the robe for different reasons. Because nowadays uh, you find uh, many, uh, they come to Chari Makan uh, because they think uh, it's go out and work, uh, it's, it's very hard life. Uh, you have to slog, uh, get scolded by the boss uh, and all that, get a lot of pressure and all that. Uh. Here, uh, you just go on arms round and come back, uh, do a bit of sweeping and then you can sleep, eat and sleep. Uh, some people think like that. Uh, they, they don't know uh, that uh, all this is they are taking on a credit card. Uh, as one of the sutta say, uh, Brother Ui pointed out, uh, you haven't become an Arya, uh, you don't deserve. Uh. <laughs> so... Oh, yeah, much dust in the eyes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. 
Actually, during the Buddha's time also, because uh, it's mentioned in the Sutta that uh, the Buddha taught the Dhamma, and then those people uh, who have suffering in the world, uh, when the Buddha explains, uh, then they see there's a way out. Uh, there's a way out of their suffering. Uh, they, because uh, unless you go out into the world and experience suffering, uh, you don't know what suffering is. After you experience suffering, uh, then you come and wear the robe. Uh, uh, if you wear it for the purpose of ending your suffering, uh, that is good. Uh, then you will strive, you see. But like nowadays, uh, like you, you mentioned the Buddhist countries, uh, the poor Buddhist countries. Uh, nowadays, uh, you find because some, some uh, Buddhist families, they are very poor. Uh, they send their children to become monks and nuns. At the age of 8 years old or 10 years old, uh, they send them to wear the robe. And they wear the robe for the rest of their life. And these people, uh, they did not come into monkhood to cultivate, to practice, to get out of samsara. They come into monkhood uh, to charimakan, to have a, a means of livelihood. Uh, such people, they are not going to strive generally. That's why you find a lot of Buddhist countries, uh, uh, over a period of time, uh, then uh, Buddhism deteriorates. Uh, because the people who come into monkhood, uh, their purpose is not to strive. Uh. And sometimes people come into monkhood too young, uh, uh, later, uh, they don't see suffering. Uh, they still think oh, they want to enjoy some more. So then they, they disrobe. No? But if, say, they come into life, uh, I mean, come into the, the robes uh, after 30, uh, uh, then it's the best, uh, I think. Uh, I mean, for unless they are very gifted people, uh, uh, there are some, uh, they come and within a short while, uh, they attain Ariyahood or Arahanhood. Uh, but those are exceptions, uh. Generally, I think if a person has already worked for some time, has uh, enjoyed some of the worldly pleasures, uh, and then he comes and wears the robe, uh, then he is no more, I mean, he doesn't have false ideas about the outside world. Uh, whatever that needs to be enjoyed, he has already enjoyed it. Uh, 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 and uh, he, he won't be easily attracted to the outside world. Uh. I see some Westerners, uh, they come into monkhood very early. They go hitchhiking and they go to Thailand. They know about Buddhism suddenly at, at the age of 20-something, uh, uh, very young. Uh, early 20s, they become a monk. That's very dangerous because they maybe they have not tasted enough of the world. Uh, and later, at the age of 50, many of them disrobe. <laughs> so it's best uh, to taste the world first. Because you come to monkhood too late in life, also very difficult. Because uh, you have very fixed habits, you know. And then you also your ego is also quite fixed already. So it's very difficult to change. You know. Like the suttas say, uh, old monk, uh, if the young monk, but more senior, uh, ask him to do this, he cannot do that, and all that, they get annoyed. You know. This fellow can be my grandson. Uh, teaching me how to do this, not to do that, and all that. Uh, this forest tradition, uh, there are good and the bad points about it. Uh. The good point is that uh, it encourages a monk uh, to live in the forest monastery, uh, which is uh, quite ideal uh, for practice. Uh. But if a monk wants to progress, uh, he must study the suttas. Definitely must study the suttas, otherwise he does not get right view. Uh, recently I've heard about some very respected uh, Thai Ajahn uh, paying respect to some lay ascetic, uh, uh, which is quite uh, surprising. Uh, so. Which the, the danger uh, is uh, if you don't study the suttas, then uh, you uh, don't get right view. But right view is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path uh, that you must attain because the suttas, uh, uh, there's one sutta, Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 117, that the Buddha says uh, the practice of the Eightfold, Noble Eightfold Path must start with right view. 
after you attain right view, that will bring you to right thoughts, which will bring you to right speech, which will bring you to right action, which will bring you to right livelihood, which will bring you to right effort, which will bring you to right recollection, right which will bring you to right concentration. So it has to be practiced in that order. So if a person does not study the, the Buddha's words, then he follows his teacher, and his teacher does not have right view, so his disciple also does not have right view. And the uh, danger I see uh, nowadays, uh, some of them uh, are too proud of their tradition. Just because their teacher uh, is famous, uh, they rely on the name of their, their, their teacher. They don't understand uh, our real teacher is not such a particular Achan or a particular Saido, uh, but the Buddha himself. Uh, the Buddha is our real teacher. So uh, we must always go back to the Buddha. Uh, and also I see some monks in the forest tradition uh, sometimes they make a show of being ascetic uh, but sometimes some of the practice uh, is actually uh, wasting time uh. they go here, going there uh, they say on Tudong uh, but it's more like a sightseeing tour uh. Uh, they go here, they go all over the forest uh, uh, I know one of our Malaysian monks, uh, he stayed many years with a famous uh, Thai Achan. Then uh, when he came back, I asked him what me method of meditation the teacher taught him. He said, no, no, no method. Uh, so you see, uh, if the teacher doesn't teach you to meditate well, does not teach you the Dhamma, he follows such a teacher, I uh, go traveling in the forest and all that now uh, just to show how ascetic you are. That is no point. Uh, that is not what the Buddha taught. So to practice the Dhamma Vinaya, you must understand what is in the Dhamma, what is in the Vinaya. Uh, if you don't understand uh, the Buddha's words uh, in the Dhamma and Vinaya, then you are not practicing the Buddha's Dhamma Vinaya. You are practicing the Achan's Dhamma Vinaya or the Sayadaw's Dhamma Vinaya, which is not the Buddha's Dhamma Vinaya. Mm -hmm. So we must always go back to the Buddha. Have I translated it?